the English Channel, ferrying legions of paratroopers bracing for the jump of their lives. Among these airborne warriors was a squad that stood out, sporting mohawk haircuts and war paint. This band of brothers, led by the wild-hearted Jake McNasty McNeese, shared laughs amidst the chaos. Defiant in the face of the relentless German anti-aircraft fire tearing through the night sky and bursting all around them. That's when the inevitable happened. Their sky train was pummeled by the enemy's flak, sending it into a perilous descent. In the frantic intermittent darkness, McNeese rallied his troops. The cabin was bathed in a red glow, a prelude to battle, pushing the men to their feet amidst the din of explosions and gunfire. They were over France, and the moment the first man was about to jump, disaster struck. A flak shell pierced the aircraft's belly, Willie Green's backpack was hit and unraveled his parachute across the inside of the hull. He was now blocking the jump door. With the C-47 now falling into pieces and plummeting from the sky, Willie fought to corral his chute and clear a path for his brothers in arms before they all crashed into the ground. Just as he managed to clear the way, McNeese took the leap into the storm of flak over Normandy. Seconds later, the sky was lit as their Skytrain was consumed in a fiery blast. McNeese thought he would never see Willie again, yet this was no time for grief. Jake and the infamous Filthy 13 were now deep behind enemy lines, tasked with a mission that could alter the course of history. Jake McNeese was tempered by fire from the cradle. Growing up during the Great Depression, he started working at age 10 to help his family make ends meet. This early test set him apart when he returned to school, excelling in football and serving as a firefighter. He was known as a rebel who played to win at all costs and became the protector of the underdog, a nightmare for any bully daring enough to cross his path. Jake's reputation as someone who defied convention and faced challenges head-on was cemented by those who knew him, encapsulated in a teacher's observation that he, quote, was not afraid of the devil. Shortly after his graduation, the United States entered World War II. Despite having a draft-exempt position as a firefighter, Jake was drawn irresistibly toward the tumult of war, spurred on by a desire to escape the aftermath of a bar fight that threatened legal repercussions. Enlisting offered him an escape and an opportunity to serve on his terms. Disdainful of the conventional infantry's passive posture, Jake was captivated by the daring of the paratrooper program, promising direct engagement with the enemy. This path appealed to his nature, envisioning himself not as a mere soldier, but as a warrior facing the enemy on his own terms in the thick of the action. Jake would later articulate his philosophy with stark clarity. If anybody wanted to take his life, quote, I wanted to look him in the eye. Creating an American paratrooper division from scratch in the middle of the most devastating war humanity had ever faced was nothing short of a high-stakes gamble. The United States, having seen the destructiveness of the German Fallschirmjäger, could no longer afford to be a mere spectator. The Germans' airborne operations had showcased the game-changing power of paratroopers, capable of altering the course of a battle by striking swiftly and forcefully behind enemy lines, leaving their opponents staggered. It wasn't just the enemy bullets that posed a threat to a paratrooper. Jumping into hostile grounds was fraught with peril. The blunt warning to Jake McNeese highlighted the grim reality. Out of every thousand men who aspired to conquer the skies, only ten would endure the brutal training and tests to claim their wings. But Jake wasn't deterred. His street smarts and knack for unconventional thinking had always paved the way for him. There was no question in his heart. He was born to be among that distinguished group of ten. While the rigorous demands of paratrooper training pushed many to their limits, Jake McNeese rose rapidly as a standout recruit. His hunger for challenge knew no bounds. Where others faltered, Jake only grew more eager, However, his exceptional physical abilities were equally matched by his rebellious streak. Jake quickly became notorious throughout the camp. Jake's blatant refusal to adhere to military protocol, especially his refusal to salute or properly address officers, opting instead for cheeky nicknames, was just the beginning of his defiance. His tendency to resolve disputes with his fists, rather than words, didn't just involve fellow recruits. It led to frequent disciplinary actions. However, his extension of this combative attitude to physically confronting officers marked a turning point, significantly intensifying the consequences he faced. This seemingly trivial dispute escalated into a physical altercation with the mess officer, cementing Jake's reputation as a troublemaker and raising concerns about his impact on morale. 
To curb his influence, Jake was transferred to a unit tailor-made for the army's most unmanageable rebels, dubbed the Dirty Five. Stationed in a rundown tent in Georgia, their living conditions were as unconventional as their attitudes. Eschewing cleanliness for practicality, they became known for their disregard for personal hygiene, earning their nickname with pride. Their defiance didn't stop at poor hygiene. Jake and his crew were notorious for missing roll calls, drunkenness, and engaging in bar fights. Their rebellious streak peaked one night when Jake intervened to protect a friend from military police, leading to a chaotic showdown that left the officers injured and bewildered. This incident led to Jake being conspicuously passed over for promotion, a deliberate rebuke for his actions. Yet despite his disciplinary issues, the military recognized Jake's invaluable skills, keeping him in the ranks against advice to discharge him. When someone suggested to Jake's commander that he should discharge him, he responded, quote, McNeese isn't hurting anything. There will be a time when you'll be awful glad to have McNeese around. When they landed in England, the Dirty Five had transformed into the Filthy Thirteen. They got busy practicing parachute jumps, gearing up for D-Day. Jumping was no joke. Even in peacetime, Jake had seen too many close calls. Parachute malfunctions weren't rare, and he'd seen friends meet their end in tragic ways, one crashing into a farmhouse and another into a beehive, getting stung so badly he was shipped back stateside. Despite the dangers, the Filthy Thirteen thrived on the adrenaline rush. When they weren't skydiving, they were the life of the party back at camp, always finding ways to blow off steam. Just days before heading to Normandy, during an advanced demolition drill, Jake couldn't resist pulling a fast one, rigging a tree to explode near a patrolling soldier, causing quite the scare. Their stunt landed the whole crew in hot water with the top brass. But after a few days of silence from the group, with no one to spill the beans, they were let off the hook to join the Normandy operation. On the eve of their departure, Jake turned heads with his face paint and a mohawk, explaining it was a nod to his Native American heritage, a mix of tradition and tactical savvy, as he figured the paint would help him blend in behind enemy lines. Only part of the story was true. Jake's mother was half Choctaw, but everything else was made up by Jake. Pretty soon, the whole squad was in on the act, buzzing their hair into mohawks and slapping on war paint. As they climbed aboard the aircraft, they looked more like fierce warriors from another era than soldiers about to drop into Nazi-occupied France. And then the world caught a glimpse. Photos of these wild-looking troops hit the newspapers, and suddenly everyone wanted to know what the Filthy Thirteen were capable of. As the deployment neared, Jake McNeese's role underwent a significant shift. Initially assigned a support task, his mission was escalated to a critical operation. His team was tasked with demolishing the bridges under the Douve Canal before seizing and securing the main bridge, a strategic move for hindering enemy reinforcements during the invasion. Understanding the mission's high stakes and the likelihood of casualties, Jake requested reinforcements, adding six more paratroopers to his squad. He was under no illusion about the dangers ahead, realistically anticipating that he might lose half of his men during the operation, their departure was set for 11 p.m. on June 5, 1944, joining the massive fleet of nearly 1,000 C-47S, each aircraft carrying brave souls ready for battle. The night was clear, and the mood among the paratroopers was a mix of anticipation and resolve, but the serenity was short-lived. Roughly 20 minutes into their flight, the first bursts of enemy flak illuminated the sky around them, a stark reminder of the peril they were flying into, the situation quickly deteriorated into chaos. Jake's plane was caught in the thick of heavy anti-aircraft fire, losing altitude rapidly. The paratroopers were forced to jump much sooner than planned. Jake's escape was narrow. He bailed out moments before the aircraft was consumed by flames in a devastating explosion that claimed several of his comrades. Willie Green was not among them. Somehow, some way, the man whose parachute had been tragically hit by enemy fire somehow made it to the ground. Army documents suggest he was later rescued from Stalag prisoner camp in Prussia almost a year later. That night, the skies over Britain bore witness to a mission fraught with heartbreak. Half of the team who soared towards destiny would never see home again. Among them is the legendary Filthy Thirteen, led by Jake, who saw more than half of his squad vanish in the chaos of the drop and the harrowing moments that followed. Yet, in the rubble and ruin of Normandy, a trio of the filthy 13's gritty survivors managed to find each other. 
Their ranks swelled by a dozen disparate US paratroopers, cut off from their own units in the confusion of battle. From the instant their boots hit the ground, they were under siege. German bullets hailed down. But these Americans had a secret weapon, the distinct crack of their rifles. This sonic signature allowed them to locate and rally to one another, standing shoulder to shoulder against the German onslaught, turning the tide with every pull of the trigger. Jake and his squad clawed their way to the heart of the Douve Canal, taking out minor bridges before zeroing in on the main prize. Their mission, seize control of the main bridge, transforming it into a vital conduit for American forces. And if they couldn't hold the line, they were to reduce it to rubble, ensuring it wouldn't serve the Germans as a reinforcement pathway to the beachheads. In a display of sheer tenacity, the filthy 13 entrenched themselves on one flank of the bridge, locking it down against German advances. For three grueling days, they weathered a relentless storm of German firepower from across the canal. Believing Jake's unit to be decimated, the US command called in a squadron of P-51 Mustangs to obliterate the bridge. Slicing through the sky, the Mustangs laid waste to the bridge, hammering both German and US positions along the canal's edges. Miraculously, Jake and his warriors, sheltered in their foxholes, emerged from the dust unscathed, ready to continue their defense. As the days wore on, the German forces found themselves on the back foot, retreating from the beachheads. Over 700 of the enemy were now ensnared in a flooded trap near Jake's stronghold, with his ranks now bolstered to 40 men. In an act tinged with desperation, the German commander offered Jake an out, proposing surrender to spare his men from annihilation. Jake's retort was as defiant as it was bold. Surrender was not in their lexicon, but they'd gladly accept the enemy's capitulation. Infuriated by the slight, the German officer ordered an all-out assault. Cool as ever, Jake instructed his men to hold fire until the enemy was fully exposed. Armed to the teeth with machine guns, mortars, and a daunting arsenal, they were a force to be reckoned with. As the Germans charged halfway to their target, Jake gave the signal. The ensuing barrage was a maelstrom of destruction, claiming the lives of nearly 700 enemy combatants in a brutal show of Jake's strategic prowess and the spirit of his men. Jake and his notorious Filthy 13, whose ranks swelled to over 30 different souls, carved a path of destruction through enemy lines, savoring every clash with the Axis powers. Despite facing severe injuries and almost insurmountable odds, Jake persevered, executing mission after mission with a blend of courage and sheer audacity. He'd often say his survival was thanks to his unyielding rebellious spirit and a penchant for pushing the envelope. Paratroopers were already among the elite, the cream of the crop of American soldiers known for their aggressiveness and skill. Jake amplified this reputation, transforming it into a full-fledged nightmare for the Axis forces. Jake's father captured the essence of his son's wartime philosophy with a poignant observation about his use of fear as a weapon. Quote, I think he was trying to build upon the idea that if they're scared of us as crazy paratroopers, well, this just makes us look crazier. Jake became one of the rare paratroopers to complete four combat jumps and live to recount these daring exploits. His journey didn't stop after Normandy. He soared through the skies into the Netherlands as part of Operation Market Garden, dropped into Germany before the Battle of the Bulge for vital reconnaissance missions, and, as the conflict neared its end, he trained as a pathfinder. Contrary to his expectations of winding down the war in an English camp, he parachuted into Bastogne, guiding crucial resupply drops amidst the fierce winter battle. In 2012, the French Republic honored Jake with the Legion of Honor Chevalier class, recognizing his valorous contributions to France. The military brass, initially wary of Jake's unruly behavior, eventually recognized the invaluable role he and his filthy 13 played in the war effort. This ragtag group transcended their wild reputation, securing their place in history for their unique battle dress and their extraordinary feats of valor. Together with historian Kaleo Griffith, Jake McNeese chronicled his thrilling wartime saga in the filthy 13, from the Dust Bowl to Hitler's Eagle's Nest ensuring that the tales of bravery, resilience, and a touch of madness that defined his unit would inspire generations to come.